Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our um, a mini med school talk. Um, and today we'll be having our uh, one of our UNC MD PhD student speakers start by introducing cardiac arrest and sudden death, followed by like a couple questions, and then we'll have our guest faculty speaker, Dr. Simpson, um, talk a little bit more about um, sudden death, sudden death, and cardiac arrest, and um, the sudden study as well. Um, so I'll go ahead and start by introducing our guest speaker, Rochelle. So Rochelle is um, from Connecticut. She studied chemical and physical biology at Harvard College. She's currently an MD PhD student at UNC um, in her first year of PhD training and she's um, studying cell reprogramming. And so she'll start us off. Thank you for the introduction, and I'm happy to be here to uh, enter this discussion on cardiac arrest and sudden death in this installment of Mini Med School. So to start things off, I am going to um, introduce some cases um, in which this topic has made it into mainstream media. So in 1993, there was a basketball player named Reggie Lewis who was on the Boston Celtics, and he was playing in a game where suddenly he felt like he was about to pass out. Um, and then later on, he was able to recover and even continue to finish the game. But this initial incident um, prompted him to seek medical care. And, you know, long story short, after a number of different cardiac assessments, um, he was eventually cleared to return playing as normal. Um, but then during practice in 1993, he actually collapsed and died from sudden cardiac arrest, um, with the cause of death being ruled as um, that due to a certain heart condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, where the, um, the ventricles or the bottom chambers of the heart were abnormally thickened. And so this was one of the cases in the early 90s of this. And then within the soccer world, there were similar stories. So three players actually suffered from a very similar series of events. So Mark Vivian Foe um, suffered from cardiac arrest during a game and died from that in 2003. Um, likewise, in 2004, Nicholas Fair um, had the same incident happen during a game and also passed away. And then Antonio Puerta similarly died during a game in 2007. And so the tragedies of these three players sparked a huge reform within FIFA or the Federal International Football Association to really start cracking down on making the sport a safer place by ensuring there were medical teams at every sporting event, practice, game, and every stadium and also mandating that um, there were AEDs or automated external defibrillators present at these places so that if a player were to experience the same thing, they could rece receive the care they need in a timely manner. And then some of you might be more familiar with this most recent case that happened last year. So LeBron James' son, Bronny, actually collapsed during a basketball practice at USC. And thankfully, his story was not as dark as the previous cases that I just shared in that he did recover and it looks like things are going well for him since he's even a prospect in the NBA draft coming up this season. Um, but still, um, these cases do highlight how um, this issue has impacted a lot of people and how it's become a big part of um, current discussions. So before I dive deeper into um, more details about sudden cardiac arrest, I do want to uh, review some basic principles of heart anatomy and overall heart function just to uh, kind of establish a framework for this discussion. So the heart is this four chamber muscle that sits within your chest and it's about the size of your fist. And if you take a cross section and open it up, you'll see that it has four chambers. So the top two are known as the atria, the bottom two are known as the ventricles. And this organ's function is to continuously pump blood throughout the body through very, very forceful contractions. And so, um, Obviously, one component of its ability to do this is that the heart is composed of a lot of muscle tissue to uh, achieve these contractions. Um, but equally important to that is the electrical conduction system that's within the heart. And so there are different uh, electrical impulses that are generated within the heart that um, travel along specialized paths within the heart to coordinate when different parts of the heart do contract. And so to kind of take you through that, um, within the SA node, there are special cells called pacemaker cells that generate these electrical impulses. And they, these electrical impulses travel to surrounding areas 
causing the atria or the top two chambers to contract and empty the blood that they have into the bottom two chambers or the ventricles. Um, and then uh, this electrical impulse uh, eventually gets to the AV node or atrioventricular node, which sits right in between the two upper chambers. There, it kind of slows down to give enough time for the two upper chambers to finish emptying all the blood into the bottom two before that signal then gets um, sent to the bottom of the heart to cause the bottom chambers to contract and push blood to the lungs or to the rest of the body. Um, and so this is a huge uh, component in assuring that the heart has the ability to continue functioning and pumping blood efficiently. And in the clinical setting, um, the way that um, uh, the electrical activity is observed within the heart is using a device called an electrocardiogram. This is a non-invasive, non-painful way to measure the electrical activity and the rhythm of the heart. And the output would be this kind of pattern that is very distinguishable to indicate that there is normal electrical um, functioning within the heart. Um, and any deviations from that would um, suggest something else. But these are all just the components that help to keep the heart functioning and help to keep blood pumping through our bodies so that we can stay alive. So when things go wrong with this electrical conduction system, that normal uh, ECG tracing that I just showed before isn't going to look quite like that. Um, instead, you're going to have what's called an arrhythmia. And so as you can see, it starts to look normal in the beginning, but then towards the end, obviously something wonky is happening there. Um, and so there are a number of different arrhythmias that can be uh, seen, but the one that I will be focusing on for the purpose of this talk is ventricular fibrillation which is when the ventricles continue to constantly and rapidly contract in a very uncoordinated manner. And the reason why this is so um, fatal is because when the um, ventricles are contracting in this very, very fast, uncoordinated manner, which is known as fibrillation, they can't um, you know, receive enough blood um, for, from the emptying um, atria and the blood just can't be pumped efficiently. And so when this blood flow is hindered by this, um, things can go south very quickly. And so emergent treatment would require um, CPR to try to keep blood pumping throughout the body or using a defibrillator to shock the heart and try to reset that rhythm into a normal um, rhythm so that the heart can go back to normal functioning. When things do go south and a person experiences cardiac arrest, um, time is very essential. So cardiac arrest is essentially when the heart stops pumping. And so as I've alluded to, this can be due to an electrical malfunction, there are other causes as well. Um, but essentially, when the heart stops pumping, um, the time goes by quickly before organs are severely damaged um, because now organs are not being, are being deprived of blood and oxygen that they need to continue functioning properly. So, within a matter of 20 seconds, the brain will be uh, affected. The brain requires a lot of oxygen and nutrients to do its function. And so, when it's not receiving that, um, there will be um, drastic effects. And one of the things that the brain does is it sends electrical signals to tell the body to continue breathing. So when the brain's not getting enough oxygen to sustain itself, it can't perform that function. And so the person can actually stop breathing in this time frame. Within two minutes, um, there is progressively worse brain injury if CPR is not um, conducted. And then within nine minutes, um, studies say that the um, brain damage that is sustained can be permanent. And 10 minutes um, after uh, cardiac arrest with no CPR being administered, uh, those chances of survival are very, very low for that individual. So some quick statistics. Um, within the US, there are about 300 to 450,000 deaths um, that are attributed to sudden cardiac arrest annually. And um, as the previous cases show, this can be a huge problem among um, student athletes and young professional athletes as well. It's the leading cause of non-traumatic death among young athletes. Um, the causes of cardiac arrest um, can also be looked at um, in terms of different causes by age group. So for younger patients or people who are under the age of 50, uh, 35, um, some of the more common causes include those fatal arrhythmias, as uh, we just discussed, um, the condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, um, which is what some of those players um, in the first slide did have. Um, where there's abnormal thickening of the muscle in the heart. Um, and then also just some congenital abnormalities or differences in the heart um, when a person was born um, that just kind of went under the radar. And in older patients who are over the age of 35, um, I think studies say that 80% of cases of people who had sudden cardiac death in this age group, um, it was attributed to 
coronary artery disease, which is basically where there is plaque buildup in the um, vessels that supply blood to the heart. Um, other you know, things that can contribute to this are just lifestyle choices. So tobacco consumption, alcohol consumption, and other things that factor into your heart's health. So um, some takeaways from this talk um, in terms of prevention, um, obviously, you know, trying to adapt heart healthy habits um, can be a can go a long way um, in terms of just trying to maintain good cardiac health. And so regularly see your PCP. Um, if you have, you know, concerns about how you're feeling or, you know, anything like that, definitely bring it up to them so that they can work through it with you to prevent anything more serious happening down the road. Um, other things like risk factor management. So again, working with your doctor to manage things like um, blood cholesterol levels and um, blood sugar levels, um, blood pressure, um, trying to maintain a healthy diet, getting into the habit of exercising regularly and avoiding tobacco intake or excessive alcohol intake. These things can factor into maintaining a uh, heart healthy lifestyle. But um, as the name and title suggests, sometimes cardiac arrest is just sudden, and it can just happen to people who had no known prior risk of the event happening um, or no inclination that they were at risk for that event. And so I think one of the things that I really want to stress um, in this talk is the importance of uh, being able to identify the signs of someone going into cardiac arrest and also knowing what to do because time is really of the essence in this situation. Um, so the signs of cardiac arrest, if you see someone um, just collapse, they're passed out, they're unconscious, they have no pulse, they're not breathing on their own anymore, they're unresponsive, you know, these should be red flags that are going off to indicate that this person is probably undergoing cardiac arrest. And again, as we show, the time is very critical here. Um, because time is so critical, we can't always just rely on the paramedics to get there in time. And so everyone can really play a role in saving a life. And so the things that, you know, steps that should be taken should be calling 911 immediately, starting CPR and doing those chest compressions to help get blood pumping through the body as well as possible, and finding an automated external defibrillator. Um, nowadays, they should be um, in a lot of different public places. You might have seen them at the gym, in school, um, in the shopping malls, and things like that. Um, and so hopefully this talk will kind of shed light on this issue, and this box um, that is seen in different public places will no longer just be a box, but it'll be understood for its life-saving purposes. And yeah, that's all I have for uh, this warm up talk. And I'll be happy to take any questions before going into Dr. Simpson's talk to dive more into the uh, topic. Yes. <laughs> What's one of the genetic you know, pathways? Yeah, so um, a lot of those ath um, athletes um, sometimes have this condition called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which does have a genetic component with mutations. Um, and so if you know there's a component to that, there's definitely a genetic factor. Um, and some other things, you know, like if you have if people have a family history of like people dying from sudden cardiac arrest. That's something that you should definitely tell your provider about just to see, you know, how they can mitigate that risk of happening in a different person. Now, as I ask you, in, in a lot of families that I know, in the older people might have died of heart attack. Right. Nobody looks at it like this. Right. Like it's, you know, when, when dust is or whatever. But how do you, for instance, when you do any, you're under 35, of course, you have to have some Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Well, cardiac arrest is actually different from a heart attack. You know, heart attack is uh, more so there's a, something wrong with the blood flow to the heart that causes the heart to not receive enough blood to function properly. Um, but then in cardiac arrest, it's an electrical problem. It can be uh, an electrical problem in which that causes the heart to stop pumping. But no problem. You can also just defer, oh, sorry. Oh. Uh, does any PCP mean the or Or is regular 
your cholesterol? I think Dr. Yes. Yeah, I think that's a great, yes. In light of that, okay. Thank you. In light of that, I will transition off to Dr. Simpson's talk. All right, um, thank you so much to Rochelle for the warm up talk. <laughs> Hello? Um, we'll now transition to Dr. Simpson's talk, and I'll start with a brief introduction. So Dr. Simpson is a professor of medicine at the UNC Department of Medicine Division of Cardiology and a clinical professor in the Department of Epidemiology. He's attended the University of Notre Dame for undergraduate training, attended med school and residency at Georgetown University, and did his cardiology fellowship at the University of Illinois. Dr. Simpson's clinical interests include preventive cardiology and cholesterol management, and as a world-class medical lecturer and collaborator towards improving car cardiovascular health, he is regularly invited to present his clinical work and research studies. Dr. Simpson's research interests include an emphasis on population and individual-focused intervention to prevent heart attacks, sudden death, and stroke. He also am. Um, is growing the sudden study at UNC, which is researching sudden death across the US. So we're gonna hang in. <laughs> and thank you. Well, that was a great introduction. I realize I'm not that famous, but I'll, I'll take the praise. Thank you. Um, so you might see how they took me out of the cast lab when I can't get this on. Got it. So that was a great lead in. Thank you. That really helped. If I were to summarize some of your talk, part of it would be don't wait for the ride. Okay. Don't wait for the EMS to come bail you out. Or if a loved one has sudden death, you really only have minutes. The brain starts to die, as we learned earlier, very quickly. Now, CPR will protect the brain, but again, it has to be efficient CPR. The thing that has happened recently, though, is we've learned that prompt defibrillation, you don't need to do CPR, okay? If you can get defibrillation within minutes, the heart recovers beautifully, as you sort of suggest. The heart has incredible resilience. I'm gonna show you some studies about sudden death. And the message here is sudden death is, it's always sudden, but it's not a surprise. The people that we have learned who die suddenly actually have risk factors that are very clear leading them towards either a heart attack, a stroke, or sudden death. So there is not a surprise in sudden death. It's always sudden, you know, question about it, but it's not a surprise how it's happened. And our research has increasingly focused, not on this thing, by the way, these are good, they really work, as one of my, and they're easy to use too. One of my colleagues, when I first, I was going to a Boy Scout camp out in the woods with my son. I wasn't worried about my son. I was worried about all the scout masters there who, who were gonna be out in the woods in a way. So I said, Dean, can you give me one of these defibrillators? Let me, and tell me how to use it. Now, I've done a lot of cardiac defibrillations. I'm very skilled in the hospital with it, but I didn't know how to use this thing. And he goes, Ross, don't be an idiot. Just open the box and do what the lady tells you. And it's designed for that. So these are really available. They, they, they're expensive, but their price is coming down. You don't have to have a sophisticated relation system. I'm going to show you some data later. First off, these things are all over. They're, they need to be all over. Uh, we did a stu our sudden study, which I'll show you data on. They're in Wake County, it's one of the most defibrillators of any re region in the country. 
and we had 400 sudden deaths, 399 sudden deaths. You know how many of those deaths were a defibrillator was used in, was attempted to be used in? Heck yes, zero. And the reason for that is people with sudden death die at home. They die in the early morning hours. They wake up dead. Now that's, I don't mean to be crude about it, but that's, you have to realize where people are dying. And that was one of the reasons we did our research. It's not, this is, the re my research is not highly academic. It's very practical. The defibrillators are in the airports, they're in the gyms where they should be, they're in the sports arenas. But we, we see the athletes who need them, but the reality is it's most of us who need them and they should be in the homes. Or one of my colleagues has developed a, uh, a system for getting a defibrillator to community health workers, so neighbors have them, kind of regional things, and go to the house. A prompt defibrillation, a very prompt defibrillation is almost successful almost all the time. But then once you get out, we learned about five, 10 minutes, the brain starts to die. The heart's very resistant to, to lack of blood. And the heart can last a long time without blood. But if you get prompt defibrillation, the heart comes right back. So let me do my talk. But I've actually given you my talk, haven't I? <laughs> it's all about prevention. The people who have sudden death are actually pretty predictable. Now, I'll come back to your LPA question, because that's one of my, I care a lot about that area. So remind me at the end that we have to do something. Okay, so let me go through this. I, have, I don't have any financial interest. I wish I did, if anybody, <laughs> but I don't, at least for this topic. Now, this is the sudden group. This was a photo taken about five years ago. The project was founded by Dr. Mounsey, who is a leading electrophysiologist, and Chip Purcell. And I was brought in really to, uh, to provide some epidemiologic guidance, how to collect data and manage large data sets. This is our team. Almost all of these young people here were students at the time. Almost all have gone on to great careers elsewhere. That's one of my jobs as I do teach. So let me tell you what I'm going to talk about. My basic theme is sudden death is, a, is common. It accounts for about 15% of all deaths under age 65. And over age 65, it's even a higher percentage. We don't know that precisely, but I do know that under age 65, it accounts for 15% of all deaths. So it's a common syndrome. It's not a pure disease. It's a syndrome, as you suggested, with multiple causes. And it depends on your age and when the, what cause you're trying to grapple with. So um, the definition, I'm gonna give you a clinical presentation. That's a frequent type of death. I'm gonna give you the risk factors. The main one is coronary artery, is atherosclerosis, hardening the arteries. Uh, oh, cholesterol, LPA. The main cause of atherosclerosis, in fact, a necessary and sufficient cause of hardening of the arteries, is an elevated LDL, is an elevated cholesterol. And that is almost certainly one of the underlying causes of premature sudden death. High blood pressure is also critical. Um, and left ventricular hypertrophy plays a big role in it as well, as, as you suggested. I, I put a, another thing there. What does that say? Social isolation with a question mark because I don't know how to measure that. I can tell you though, one of the biggest risk factors for a man dying suddenly is what? Divorced. Marriage works, ladies. Uh, that, <laughs> I'm not going down that path. Thank you. I'm going to stay neutral here. But part of it is just a simple, there's nobody there to find you when you collapse. Right. That's my, you're like me, don't, I don't think you're going to have a good evening tonight. So, But there's no question. The other part of it is, is, I say social isolation. It also means medical isolation, not going to see the doctor, not being able to see the doctor. I'll show you that data. But I'm calling it social isolation because I can't really measure it precisely like I can your blood pressure or cholesterol. Um, the underlying cause is almost always a chronic disease, most often hardening of the arteries and poorly controlled cholesterol and high blood pressure. And I'm going to talk mostly about preventing. I truly believe that the vast majority of sudden deaths are preventable. But they have, somebody has to do something to prevent it. 
Now, this is this is a real patient. Um, if you if you go on the top, it's really continuous. It goes down. You can see it goes down like that. This is a patient with, as, as you suggest in your talk, this is a patient with paroxysmal ventricular fibrillation. It has a fancy name to it. But it's essentially a, a woman who was exposed to a drug that she shouldn't have been, not, not a, a medicine that she, she didn't tolerate. She developed, um, the actual term is torsade de plant, but it's a very fast recurrent ventricular tachycardia. She didn't die, by the way. She had recurrent syncope, showed up in the emergency room, said, here it is again. And this time she did die, was resuscitated, and was perfectly fine once we got her treated. But this is what sudden death actually looks like. Now, it, I really, this, so think of it as a syndrome, meaning there's multiple causes of it, but it really depends very much on, um, this is a complicated slide, I don't mean to show this, but basically what I'm, I'm saying here is there's, for each age group, so in young, in children, sudden death is often genetic. There's no question about that. In athletes, it's often genetic as well, with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy playing a big role. Then as you get older, it's often still partly genetic. Then it's related more to um, an interaction of genes and environment. So at my age, at many of your ages, it's really almost always the environment. Wow, why didn't I take my statin? My hair was falling out. No, 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 I should have taken it, I guess. I'm gonna to get to that, ladies and gentlemen. But I see the smiles in the room. You know where I, where I live. Okay, so, um, so we took a population approach. Oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Really appreciate your help. Good job. Okay, so as I said, when in our, we did a study looking at the population and weight counting. So we took a population and weight counting. We worked with EMS to identify all sudden deaths in the field. We adjudicated the cases with cardiologists. And then we ended up with, I said, about uh, 399 victims of sudden death who had died in the field. And what we learned from them was that 14% of all deaths with under age 65 were due to sudden unexpected death. So this is one of the most common causes of death in working age adults. Three quarters of the deaths would have been, well, don't worry about that. Hypertension, coronary disease, high cholesterol, uh, sleep apnea, okay? Guys, sleep apnea is becoming more and more important as a trigger or, or, or a risk factor for sudden death. And diabetes were very common in the victims of sudden death. Now, this is, this is since we, we could actually, we knew where these people died, and so we could actually geocode their death. And this is a map of Wake County with where the pictures, where, where the actual deaths occurred. Most of the deaths occurred in rural parts of the county. Most of the deaths occurred, um, like I said, no defibrillator was used in attempting to, when the rescue squad arrived, they obviously used the defibrillator, but no, no uh, person initiated defibrillator was used. Um, don't wait for the ride. My approach is non-traditional, but from a uniquely Western perspective. Um, I like to drink, not all the time and not frequently. How many of you drink red wine for preventive purposes? Good. Red wine is great, it's flavorful. Don't do it for prevention. Alcohol is addicting. It's, it's clearly toxic in high doses. And addicting means it tends to lead us to higher doses. So it's a myth that um, alcohol, red wine is protective. Now I'm gonna walk you through some gross slides. Now gross means big. It does not mean disgusting, but I can promise you no one will eat a piece of pizza tonight. Sorry, but you, have, you wanna see what we're dealing with. This is actually an animal model of atherosclerosis. This is a hog, where this is the aorta of a hog. And hogs, by the way, have physiology that's very similar to people. Okay, and those small, those look, these things here, this is where the head is, that's the feet. These are the arteries that feed the spine. And this here is the earliest stage of atherosclerosis. This is what you see in, um, in children. 
as we children whose cholesterol is high, they start developing plaque buildup where the fat gets under the under the under the inner layer of the artery wall and starts building up those kind of plaques, just like hogs do. Now, if you take that hog and feed him Land O'Lakes butter, animal parts, this is what happens. And this could be the aorta of, a, of an older adult. You can see this, these are fatty deposits under the skin, under the endothelium, under the inner surface. You can see that these arteries to the spine are closing off. This is an advanced atherosclerosis in an animal model, but it's very similar to what we see in adults with advanced, with advanced hardening of the arteries. Now, this is a picture of a coronary artery. This is someone who died. This is a major coronary artery here. Uh, the, the, the artery has kind of been dissected away from the muscle. Now, when, when friends and families have a calf, they're going to say, oh, it was a blockage here. We opened it. That's true. But what they didn't tell you is that atherosclerosis is not segmental. You can see that the blockages here are go through the whole artery. The whole artery is diseased. There may be a critical blockage somewhere that the cardiologist or surgeon has opened. That's great. That's life-saving. But the disease is still there. And it's not, it, you're, that's not a treatment for the disease. The, the stenting and the bypass surgery are rescue operations. Necessary, important, life-saving. Improve quality of life with them. But they are not treating the progression of the disease. Now, a heart attack or some most forms of sudden death occur. This, this is a occur when a coronary artery, the fat gets into the artery wall, and fat is so it's butter, right? So fat is gushy and soft. And what this is a cross section of a coronary artery, of a human coronary artery, where someone who had died, sudden death. This is the fat deposits in the artery wall. This is the lumen, the open you know, where blood flows. Now, what happens here is under stress, physical stress, emotional stress, viral illnesses, that plaque ruptures. And it's not like it ruptures and they bleed out into the rest of the body. It ruptures, then blocks the artery. And that is one of the leading causes of sudden death in older adults. It's also the cause of most heart attacks. You can see this is what's left of that flat, fat, fatty rich plaque. The artery is open, is not open. There would be a blood clot there. So that's what the cardiologists do. Someone's having acute heart attack. They go in, open that artery, and repair it with a stent. And they do great work. Now, I hear this all the time. We are what we eat. Well, maybe, but. The, probably the most common genetic abnormality in adult, in humans, is the genetic form of high cholesterol. It's called familial hypercholesterolemia. It's, it's present in about 1 in 200 to 1 in 300 people. It's real common. And that's manifested by high cholesterol through adulthood. This has been with us since humans, I don't know, built the, built the pyramids. This is, a, this is a CT scan of a mummy from over a thousand years ago, 2,000 years ago. And these, what, this is the bones, okay? What's that? What does it look like? You know, med students here are chomping at the bit. That's the arteries feeding the legs, and they're calcified. This is atherosclerosis in a 2,000, 3,000 year old mummy. Almost certain, and they, they did not eat like we eat these days. So this is almost certainly a genetic form of high cholesterol that has been passed on to us through our human lifespan. So, well, now that you have it, you can stop worrying about getting it, okay? I, I know that's more cynical than most of you like to hear, but we have to realize we are dealing with uh, a genetic disease and a poor diet that is important we deal with. Now, the good news here is we can deal with it. I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on this. Now, one thing we did learn on our study, and I've talked about social isolation. Most of the victims of sudden death 
had mental illness of some type. This was depression, or um, they had a diagnosis of alcohol, excessive alcohol use, or excessive recreational drug use. Now, none of our victims overdosed. We excluded them. But I'm just showing here that I'm putting the word social isolation encompassing a lot of things. One is mental illness was here. I'm going to show you that poverty and lack of insurance were also parts of this too. This is another part of our study. Um, we found that rural people who live in rural communities were more likely to have sudden death than live in urban communities. And it, and it was really predicted by lower income and lower insurance status. Is it important that we expand Medicaid coverage? Duh. Okay. I'm going to show you why it's important in a minute too. I, I want to. I do want to be political on some of these things. The other thing is it important to see your doctor. We heard about how that important is, and that actually is critical. Most of our sudden death victims had not seen a doctor in two years. Um, this is just showing you that you know about a third of the victims. That's that lower line really didn't see the doctor at all in two years. Um, another third really saw the doctor kind of on average, as you would expect, one or two times in two years. And then a large percentage saw the doctor a lot. However, almost none of these patients were on evidence-based medicines for the blood pressure, for the diabetes, or for um, their, 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 their lipids. Meaning that there was an inefficient use, I don't know the right words here, I'm not sure, I don't want to blame the doctor or the patient, but there was an inefficient use of medical care here. And even the people who saw the doctor did not get the care that could have saved their lives. What about air pollution? We've had the privilege of working with the Environmental Protection Agency and uh, Wayne Cassio, who's the director of research in our region, really encouraged us to look at diesel dust. And this, and what we found is that uh, exposure to diesel dust, a bad air day, when you go out on a bad air day and go for your run, you have a 15% higher risk of having a sudden death than if you go out on a clean air day. And this is actually what it, the slide shows. It's just the baseline. You can see that one day after a lag period, because it takes a while for the diesel dust and air pollution to juice up your immune system, causing all this inflammation. And inflammation is what triggers that bad event I showed you on the slide. Um, it increases your risk. So diesel dust is bad. Now the good news here is that trees save lives. This was another, we did, an, we did a reanalysis of this data. It's a little complicated slide, I apologize for that. But just to summarize it, it shows that people who live near greenways um, that that excess risk from poor air quality was it was went away. Greenways make a difference. Now I say trees save lives. I that's a little exaggerated. Greenways save lives. So if you have an opportunity to promote greenways, you know, walking paths, running paths in your community, it's worth it. People's attitude makes a difference. These are some of the, uh, we did a qualitative assessment of uh, families that experienced sudden death, trying to figure out why didn't people go see the doctor? Why didn't things get different? And we found several things. We don't know how to, again, this comes under my thought. How do we conceptualize this? How do we deal with it? We found a sense of surrender, like a hopelessness. Well, he just died. There's nothing we could do. Um, we found also a bad doctor-patient relationship. The doctor was regarded as being smart, knows what he's doing. He's told me to eat less fat. I can't. I have to. What I have to. So I grow pigs. I'm going to eat the fat. You know, there was a sense that the doctor was not communicating on my level. There was a strong sense of lack of proactivity, meaning that, um, yeah, I'm having chest pain. But the corn, the, the crops have to get in before it rains. No, I'm not going to see the doctor today. I've got things that are more pressing. That's not a criticism of the people. It's, an, it's a description of priorities. And it's a description of a little bit of a sense of hopelessness that we saw in, that we believe we're seeing 
and sudden death victims. I'm here to fix the lasagna. I have to do this a little bit because it gets a little dense and we need a little breakup every now and then. Um, in our clinic, in our lipid clinic, what we tell patients is that it's most people in Chapel Hill eat pretty well. You're not going to improve your life. You're not going to improve your survival, avoid sudden death by cutting out on lasagna. Most of you do a pretty good job with that. Statins, let the medicines do the heavy lifting. Okay, I'm not. I'm not saying everybody needs that, but I am saying that you're not going to correct a lipid problem with more aggressive dieting. What we see is a lot of young people who do follow a good diet, they respond brilliantly to just very low doses of medicine. So what I'm getting to here is that there's a lot of treatment options and some of the medicines just work great. Um, <laughs> it's not you, it's me and my new boyfriend. Okay, yeah, I, I remember I have no... Well, it's a bad joke, but it is funny at times, I think. What I'm getting to here is the new boyfriend has to be medical therapy for our genetic predisposition for atherosclerosis. Diet exercise works brilliantly, but for adults to get down to the levels that are safe when you start to regress that plaque is almost not possible. There's lots of good reasons to eat well, but to prevent a heart attack and stroke at my age not going to work. Now, um, we did some analysis. Well, let me basically, lack of insurance were strong predictors of sudden death. Um, we were very concerned when the supplemental food program was going to be killed because that was a way of actually regressing, of getting some more funds to poor people. And we felt this would have a negative impact on sudden death. Now, this is an important, I'm changing gears a little bit on you. This is an important slide. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us have high blood pressure? Don't raise your hand, okay? Right. You can raise your hand if you want. Okay. How many of us have um, high cholesterol? Higher than ideal. Don't raise your hand. Okay. So how many of us have a sugar problem? Okay. Now, those are one, two, or three risk factors. And we always think they're just added together. A oh, little diabetes, a little high blood pressure, a little cholesterol, not a big deal. No. Risk goes up logarithmically with these risk factors. And that's what I'm going to show you here. Meaning that you have high blood pressure and high cholesterol. You're, if you, well, I'll do it this way. This is if you, if you smoke, you have about, you double your risk of having a heart attack. If you have diabetes, you about double your risk of a heart attack, just alone. If you have high blood pressure, you about double your risk of a heart attack. If you have high cholesterol, you double or triple your risk of a heart attack. What about if you have one, two, and three? This doesn't go up threefold. This goes up 16-fold. This is what I'm trying to say. The risk factors don't add together. They, they go up logarithmically together. So if you happen to have all four of those, your risk isn't four times higher. It's, I think that's 64 times higher of having a heart attack. Is it important to control those individual factors? Yes, because you can almost, you can normalize those risk curves. No exclamation needed? Sorry. Um, so, I think I covered that point. Let me talk about diet. Traditional, the traditional Chinese diet um, is actually very low risk. Um, the, the, that was called the oriental diet pattern. And that just shows you those people who follow a traditional oriental diet actually don't have lower than expected risk. They have about average risk. In the past, that was the opposite. But the oriental diet used to be very low in saturated fat. Um, how, how many of you been to China or Taiwan? Anyone? The closer you get there, the, high, the higher the fat content. In fact, I couldn't eat, I love Chinese food. I couldn't eat Chinese food the closer I got to, to, to China. And that was because of the fat. It was, it's become a diet very rich in saturated fat. 
The end result of that, even though it's high in vegetables, it just is neutral. A Western diet, as you see, the risk goes up the more you go to Wendy's and, and eat a traditional Western diet. If you follow a Mediterranean diet, that's a prudent diet, that's not a low saturated fat diet, it's just a prudent balanced diet, you can see your risk goes down the closer you follow. The diet makes a difference. Um, it's not the cure-all, but it makes a huge difference in avoiding a heart attack. Hmm. You never buy anything I want. This is, marriage is important, okay? So I talked a lot about sudden death, and then I talked a lot about hardening the arteries. And the reason for this is in the US, there's an overlap here. For a working age adults, that's between 18 and 64, most of these deaths are due to atherosclerosis, undiagnosed and untreated. But an important percentage are due to other things poorly controlled hypertension, left ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomyopathies. But if we have an impact on atherosclerosis, we will have a preventive, we will have a huge impact on sudden death. So sudden death is an unexpected natural death within hours of the first symptom. It's a frequent type of death. Pre predisposing factors include coronary artery disease, high blood pressure, poverty, social isolation with my question mark. I don't know how to characterize that fully. Treatment is not only possible, it's very, it's possible and implementable. Prevention invo involves efficient use of medical services. I really feel strongly that, you know, I, I'm, tr <laughs> I'm a clinical professor of epidemiology. I'm supposed to talk about populations, you know, and health that way. But I really think right now, if we're going to have an impact on sudden death, it's going to be through the medical community. Now, there's a lot of barriers there. Many of the doctors, PAs, nurse practitioners have to be treating patients for the diseases, the syndromes that, that we know are associated with sudden death. Um, so prevention involves efficient use of medical care. No one is making you do anything you don't want. I'm just saying we're all headed to Dodge City, and we think you should come along. Take your statins. <laughs> you knew where that was coming from. I've covered a lot of ground, and I do apologize. Some of it was a little more technical than I wanted to present. My message is, don't wait for the ride. The defibrillators are very good. They're inexpensive. Well, inexpensive. They're about $1,000. Um, on the other hand, they really, really do work. They're, they're, you have to get trained in it, but they do work. On the other hand, what works I think far better is prevention. And the keys to prevention are managing the major risk factors for atherosclerosis. That includes cholesterol, blood pressure, probably sleep apnea, and probably some of the other conditions that lead to accelerated atherosclerosis. I'll stop at this point. Um, I don't I have to leave time for questions. I don't mind taking personal medical questions. That might be good afterwards in private. I'm happy to stay, or they might throw us out. We can stand in the lobby and do that. Um, whatever works for people. So how can I help? Yeah. I'll do the LPA question. You want to do that? So ask the question again. Okay, so LPA is a, uh, a new, novel, new risk factor. It's a cholesterol containing particle that's in the blood coagulation test. And what we've learned is that elevated LPA, when it's really high, like three times above normal, increases your risk for strokes and, and heart attacks. It's real. Uh, and, and it's not measured in the normal cholesterol test. So right now in our lipid clinic, we're screening everybody. About 10% of adults have an elevated LPA, and 1% have an elevated LPA that's three times above normal. Three times above normal is a risk factor. It's not a disastrous risk factor, but it's important. Right now, we can't treat it. So part of the question is, is hype? Well, we can test for it. We cannot treat it. There's 
the drug companies are doing major clinical trials to see we can lower it, we know, but we don't know if lowering it makes a difference. So what we do in the lipid clinic, if somebody comes in with very high LPA, we many times will put them on a baby aspirin and we will lower their LDL more than we would have otherwise. We'll lower their risk by lowering the risk that's a, that goes with LPA. So it is important. Your doctor will increasingly be screening for that. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's actually a couple questions. They're great questions, but let me, I won't remember all of them, but so basically two thirds of our victims died at home. Now, some of the, well, I remember some of these stories because of the social isolation, I'll come back to that. I mean, one victim was found two days later on his kitchen floor. Okay, we found other in his backyard a day later. And that was one of the reasons we did the study. So we wanted to be, those people are important. We wanted to know why they were dying. Two thirds die at home. There is a clear time thing that most of them, most of the deaths appear to occur in the early morning hours. Now that, that's not a quiet time. Um, many of you, many people have sleep apnea. In sleep apnea, you can see the rhythm disturbances that occur. Sleep apnea is where, for whatever reason, you're closing off your airway, you're just smothering, basically, during sleep. And the peak time for that is generally the early morning hour. That's when you're in your deep REM type sleep or deeper than REM. And that's when the airway closes off, you get hypoxia. And you have rhythm disturbances. We see a lot of those rhythm disturbances. Now, we don't know if that's the cause of the sudden death. But it's not a quiet time, even though the person, you would think they're not resting, or you would think they're not exerting themselves. But these deaths seem to occur not with exertion. They seem to occur relatively quiet times. Um, did I get all the questions? OK. So and that, that's another reason why it's, it's important to understand this better. What is the trigger there? The sleep apnea alone isn't the problem, but it seems to act as a trigger for some of these deaths. And that's our working hypothesis, unproven. Important to breathe. That's right. Not very. So the electrolyte, I, I got, how effective are electrolyte treatments for preventing sudden death? Vitamins are probably important. Electrolyte potassium is important. We know that a diet high in potassium, low in sodium is as good as a single blood pressure medicine. So electrolytes are important, but they're more important in the negative sense. It's hard to take enough. Your body just won't allow you to, you can eat a lot of potassium, but your body regulates it in the blood very tightly. So it really doesn't go up too much for most people. So electrolytes are important, but they're more important in the negative sense that if they get low, like if your potassium gets low, and like a fluid pill or diuretic, that's a problem. And that can potentiate arrhythmias and sudden death. So, but that's more in the, pot, in the negative rather than you can do something preventative by eating better. I love you. Yes, that's exactly what should happen. We, we, many of the rural, poorer communities have developed a, a system, community health workers. And the idea here is that somebody in the community would be on call, would have a defibrillator and would, would bring it, would get a call when there's an event and go there and could get there faster than the rescue squad. Um, in some of the rural counties, uh, for example, we've done an exploration in some of the rural counties in North Carolina. And the rescue squad just can't get there. They're within you know, 30 minutes, an hour sometimes. It ain't gonna work. So you can't do CPR that long to be effective. So 
another colleague of, of mine has developed um, uh, sending by um, the flying the, those flying things out and de de delivering defibrillators to homes. So those are all viable options. These things will get less expensive. I think if if someone in your family or loved one is high risk, this is not a bad investment. But again, you have to be aware. You have to be trained and you're. All right, we can do 30 minutes pretty easily and get out and get home. So the defibrillators are not the solution. They're kind of the stopgap rescue activity. And that's why I brought it to show you that it's, it's, it really works, but it's not, it's not the ideal solution for this problem. I didn't understand. Yes. Yes. Inflammation. Um, so can I say a little bit more about inflammation as a risk factor for sudden death or um, um, for a heart attack? Inflammation is important. The lipids don't can't really get into the artery wall without some degree, something to modulate them getting in. And inflammation seems to make it easier for the lipid particles to get. Inflammation seems to be a trigger for heart attacks. They often see in that, I showed you that picture of the coronary artery, in those margins, they often found, find white cells from inflammation, like a viral illness or something that has juiced up the immune system. So there are white cells breaking down tissue. And inflammation is an important risk factor. It's not, so for example, um, some of the arthritis patterns, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic, some of the arthritis have, and other diseases like HIV disease have a high inflammatory state. And we think that is an independent risk factor for heart attacks and sudden death. Now that doesn't mean you treat the inflammation, but what it does mean you treat the lipids better. <laughs> it's very hard to treat inflammation without treating the cause of the inflammation. So, so, but inflammation is an important risk factor and it's emerging. There are some treatments now. Um, colchicine, which is an old treatment for gout, is now used to treat inflammation and has been shown to reduce the incidence of second heart attacks. But again, the fundamental thing is treat the real cause, which is the lipids or the high blood pressure. But we do think inflammation is an important trigger. How successful is AED? I, I trained in electrophysiology in, when I was your age, okay? And I tell the joke, I always gross people out with this. I've killed a, a thousand times. Because in those days we used to, I never lost a patient. When we, in the lab those days, we would have to, we would do serious, we didn't have the defibrillators like we do now. We didn't have the implantable defibrillators. So we would look for drugs that would prevent sudden death. And we were successful with this, but it meant Inducing ventricular fibrillation, shocking them, giving a drug, shocking them again. You know, that sounds horrible, but it really isn't, as long as it's done quickly and without you know, pain to the patient. The point is a prompt defibrillation is nothing. Now, again, if there's still a blocked artery, all it does is buy you some time to open the artery. The time is what you need to fix a problem. So prompt defibrillation is really incredible. In fact, it's so good for many situations. If you do it fast enough, you don't need to do CPR. Now, I know I'll get yelled at for that. Don't quote me to the Heart Association. But it's, it really, really works. Now, CPR will keep the brain functioning, but how well it keeps the heart functioning is always is open to debate. It does both. What we've learned, first of all, let's say, I'm gonna make this up. Let's say you, someone's LDL cholesterol is 140. You get it down to 100, disease slows down. It doesn't progress. It suppresses a little bit. You get it to 70, under 70, you start getting the fatty content come out of the artery wall. 
Now it doesn't reverse the calcified scarring. That may even may even increase that because that's a healing process. But the actual fat content and the stability of the plaque, because there's less inflammation in the plaque, decreases. So the current guidelines are being modified. Uh, so high risk people now we're going increasingly for under 60 or under 40 LDL for high risk situations. And because that's when you get not just stability of the plaque, but you actually get healing of the plaque. That artery I showed you of the young person, you know, or the other young pig, the piglets. If you treated that, that fat would come out of the artery wall. If you got the LDL done, it's a dynamic process. It's influx and outflux. Now there is a certain point when there's so much calcium and scarring, it doesn't work. But for most adults, it works real fine. Yes, yes, yes. Can I can I answer that? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, we, we got to stay in business here, you know. <laughs> well, Dr. Simpson gave it to me by lowering the standards. I got it. I got it. So, so let me explain why cholesterol is made in the liver for the most part, but the liver regulates it. It has receptors on, on the liver. And these are receptors and they pull in, remember cholesterol is a fat, so it's not soluble in water or blood. So it travels in little, little particles, globules. And the liver pulls in these particles and breaks it down. It, it regulates it. So we need cholesterol, but it regulates the amount. The trouble is we get older, we lose those receptors. Just as an, it seems to be a natural function of aging. And so our cholesterol is expected to go up as we get older. Okay. The people who have that genetic form of cholesterol, the familial hypercholesterolemia, they're born with half the number of those receptors that you or I have. And so their cholesterol starts off, not maybe not twice normal, but pretty substantially above normal. And those go up faster as they lose those receptors as they get older too. So, Cholesterol is the second, but the other part of your question is also important. Why do so many people have high cholesterol? Well, um, I think it's a combination of the genetics and then our diet. I mean, our diet, a Western diet, especially in young people, is pretty high in saturated. It's gotten better, no question. Well, yeah, I have grandkids too. It's, so um, the, but, in, in primitive societies where there is a you know, very rare primitive society these days, but 20, 40 years ago when you could actually measure lipids in primitive societies, their lipids are low and stay low over a lifetime. So our normal lipids, our average LDL in this country is around 100 for adults. That's not, that's not the right level. It probably should be around 70 or 60. So we are population, we, the term is a sick population. Why it's sick is not clear. It's partially genetics, but it's also partially, it's a good, I think it's a mostly diet and lack of exercise that makes this a problem. Yes, trans fats. If you want one word, trans fats. Uh, they get converted to saturated fats pretty quickly in the body. And second, they seem to have a higher atherogenic risk than just saturated fats. And, you know, the other th message now is processed foods. I, I, that's a little more complicated. I'm not an expert in that area. But I think the main thing is you want to eat, eat your vegetables. I mean, I mean you just, it's just in, becoming increasingly important. Well, yes. Go ahead. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paige, if you haven't met me yet. I'm one of the people who helps to run the seminar series with Matthew. 
Um, and I just wanted to give an extra plug for our next session, uh, which I believe is May 21st, um, because it's gonna be a little different than our normal sessions. Typically for mini med school, we focus a lot on specific diseases um, and how we diagnose them, treat them, many of those things. But another part of medical school is also learning about the various tools we have to identify these diseases and go about treating them. So actually our last session is gonna be focused on ultrasound, um, which is an imaging modality that we can use um, to look at various different portions of the body. Um, so we're really excited for this session. We want it to be um, very informative. A lot of people have had ultrasound throughout their life, so maybe you have, and this can help you know a little bit more about what you're looking at if you ever have one in the future. Um, the people who will be running that session will be bringing actual probes, like ultrasound probes, um, and potentially we'll be doing a demonstration if we can convince them to. If not, there will definitely be videos. But So please come to our last session on May 21st.